Well, uh, good morning to you all. Very warm welcome on this uh, sunny September day. Just thought I'd highlight that because tomorrow. <laughs> uh, so we need to make the most of it uh, today. Anyway, it's great to be uh, together to worship God, whether you're here in the building, whether you're at home joining us uh, live online. Uh, we greet you and welcome you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, the only name on which we can come and approach uh, the living God um, through the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to begin with some words from uh, Isaiah uh, 25. Um, speaking of what the Lord will do, this is what uh, Isaiah sees. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats and the finest of wines. On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. It's a picture of the great salvation that he, God is going to bring, a feast of blessings triumphing over death, that great shroud and enemy that uh, encompasses us all. And of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is risen from the dead, uh, that salvation comes to us. Well, let's sing of our risen Lord Jesus. See what a morning. And uh, let's stand and sing uh, if we're able and praise God together. to repeat some but uh, there's more great songs to come and I don't want to wear you out. Let's uh, seek God in prayer together. 
you're a great God and a good God, powerful and majestic. And so we bow before you and worship and adore you for who you are, acknowledging that you are the one that made each one of us, made the world in which we live, the one whom ultimately we all stand before and are accountable to. We praise you this morning that uh, a great triumph, your great triumph over death has been accomplished. As we've just sung, death is dead, love has won, Christ has conquered. And we say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. And Lord, we praise you that you're not just triumphant in death and that uh, uh, righteousness excels, but also in defeating death. And so ultimately we marvel that it's grace that triumphs over all. Your loving heart of generosity, forgiving us who deserve death that we might enjoy eternal life. And so as your people who by our nature are sinners and have offended you, we come this morning just marveling because we get to experience and to enjoy that grace to know you in all of your love and kindness and goodness. And that, Lord, you've promised, you've prepared a feast for us. And for that, we give you thanks. That living hope, which is ours through the Lord Jesus Christ, which is knowing the Lord Jesus now and then looking forward to being with him forevermore. So, Lord, help us today as we explore these things further. Help us to gaze and to wonder and to worship. Lord, you know our hearts this morning. Uh, some come with heavy hearts, some come downcast. Others are just plodding from day to day. Some are frustrated with uh, life and uh, their lot, as it were. But Lord, we pray whatever our circumstances, whatever frame of mind or heart we come together today, Lord, we pray that we might be filled with joy that comes as we fix our eyes on the Lord Jesus and as we fellowship and feast with him, uh, both individually and corporately together. And so our prayer is that as we worship, you would renew our minds uh, and help us to see and reflect and to learn of your great mercy. So forgive us for our, all our sins, our God, we pray. And by your spirit, bless us richly. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. We're going to read a few words from uh, Romans 8, glorious uh, words, uh, which remind us just how secure we are in the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, 37 to 39, knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm convinced, says Paul, that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We are safe and secure in him. Well, let's sing of that reality. He will hold me fast, even when we fear our faith may fail, he will hold me fast. And after we've uh, sung this song, uh, Lauren is going to come and uh, read for us. And uh, it's her last Sunday for a little while. We're working her hard playing drums and then she's going to read God's word as well. Well, let's stand and sing first. He will hold me fast.
First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 12. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil or fade. This inheritance is kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In all this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Concerning this salvation, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. Thank you, Lauren. Right, children, it's time for our children's talk, which means we need to open our envelope. Remember, we're looking at themes from 1 Peter. So this is a letter that Peter wrote in the Bible, and we're looking at a theme each Sunday. So let's open up and see what theme it is this Sunday morning. Oh, it's, it's a big page, this. Keep going, keep going. Right. Can anybody read... The word written in green. Yes, was that Christ? Yes, Christ. I'm just going to put that there. Christ, yes, Christ is the theme we're going to look at just briefly this morning. Uh, you might have spotted it in our reading if you were paying attention. Uh, but what does Christ mean? Well, first of all, uh, whenever you read Christ and Messiah, know that that means the same thing. So it's, it's talking about the same person. Don't, don't think they're two different people. They mean exactly the same thing. But also, Christ isn't a surname. You know, my name, Mark Frost. You got Susie Babanko, haven't you? Yes. Who else have we got? Well, we've got Reuben Wharton, haven't we? Yes. Uh, but we, you see... That's a surname. We're very familiar with surnames, aren't we? And we often think that Jesus Christ is just simply a surname. But actually, it's more than just a surname. It's a title. It's a title that means king. So when you think of Christ, think of King Jesus, Christ Jesus. But also, we, we need to know that Christ means something specific in the, in the Old Testament. It means this, anointed one. Now, that, that's strange, isn't it? What, what on earth does anointed one mean? Well, believe it or not, back then, in fact, even now, it happened with Queen Elizabeth when she was uh, coronated. Crowned. Crowned. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You can spot the royalist in the house, Derek. <laughs> um, you pour oil onto... I've got some good quality oil here. Uh, good brand of extra virgin olive oil that you pour onto the head of the person who is going to be king or queen. Now, I did think, could there be a volunteer in the house this morning? <laughs> but even my hands are getting greasy by just touching this. And uh, if I poured it on somebody's hair, their hair is going to be greasy. Their clothes are going to be messed up. But also, actually, I'm not going to do it because it's, it was, it's a very serious thing. Because it, it tells us, by being anointed, it tells us that God is, God is setting apart a representative, a chosen one, a king, to serve him. And so that's what, that's what Christ means. But also in the Old Testament, when they were reading about this, this, this Christ, this anointed one, this king, they, they realized that, that there was, there was going to be somebody who was going to come and rescue them. 
Uh, they, were, they were really holding on to a promise, particularly a promise that God had made to King David. Remember big King David, the great King David? Uh, and and the King da God had promised to King David that there would always be a royal line. There would always be, a, there would always be sons, grandsons, great-grandsons would be kings if they obeyed God. Uh, and so they were holding on to this promise, particularly after, believe it or not, the kings were no more when the Babylonians invaded. And so they were holding on to this promise, even then, that a king would come. And, and what they realized by reading the Old Testament, that this king would come and would give them victory, would rescue them from their enemies. But if you read really careful in the Old Testament, this king, this Christ, also is one that will come and suffer. So we have his sufferings and his victory. That's what we've got to read out, watch out for when we're reading about the Christ. And so this is, this is the anticipation of the Christ in the Old Testament. And we know, don't we, that Jesus is that Christ. Jesus is that king. Just listen to what Matthew says right at the beginning of his gospel. Matthew says this. This is the genealogy. This is the family tree of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ, the son of who? the son of David, because Matthew and everybody else after Jesus realized that Jesus was that promised king who would come to give victory, but we know he came to give victory through suffering. And so the New Testament is obsessed with this Christ. They want to know, they, they write so much about Jesus Christ. Do you know how much, how many times Christ is mentioned in the New Testament? Anybody think it's a uh, hundred times? Hands up a hundred times, two hundred times, three hundred times, four hundred times, still no, still nobody, five hundred times. Well, believe, believe it or not, I've done the counting. Well, I've got a computer to do the counting for me, <laughs> uh, which is more accurate than I would ever do. Five hundred and forty-three times in the New Testament, Christ is mentioned because Jesus is the center. He is the king who has come and he's rescued, and he's come through suffering. And that's what we're going to learn a little bit more about adults as we look at, at Jesus this morning. But remember, the Christ, the anointed one, is the king who comes, and he comes to win the fight against death and sin for us. So just remember that. Remember the oil. Remember who he is. Well, before you go to Bible Explorers, and before uh, adults learn a little bit, a bit more about Jesus, we're going to sing very appropriately, Consider Christ, the source of our salvation. So if you're able, please join me in standing and singing to praise God for Jesus Christ, our Lord and King.
Before we do anything else, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you would be with us now by your Spirit to show us more of this Christ, of Jesus. Would you open up our eyes to it as, as we look at this wonderful, amazing salvation. Lord, be with the children as well, the teachers and Bible explorers. Would you help the, the teachers the, to show the, the children more of Jesus as well? And would we all uh, leave this morning uh, more in love with you as a result of what we learn? In Christ's name, amen. Amen. So, in the film Captain Fantastic, which I don't expect you to have seen, starring Viggo Mortensen, so think Aragorn, Lord of the Rings. It's about a father who raises his children in the wild. And there's a scene that has always struck me in that film. Uh, the family have to come out of the wild because of a funeral. Um, into normal society and the, the children uh, they're in, you know, in, a, in shops and fast food places and the children start laughing and the father asks them why, why are you laughing uh, and the children reply people are just so fat <laughs> well, well no the father rightly rebukes them and says we don't mock or disrespect people but then the youngest one quips unchallenged except Christians except Christians. Now I'm convinced one of the reasons why many people disrespect Christians and find it mockable, maybe find it insignificant in their lives is because they haven't fully grasped the gospel and the salvation on offer, just how amazing this salvation is. And the problem is when Christians, when they, when they feel mocked, maybe when they feel disrespected, even when they just feel generally just, just struggling in life, we can also begin to maybe question whether this salvation is worth it. Is, is this salvation really truly that amazing when I'm trudging through the trenches of life? Well, in our passage, Peter begins this, this morning in verse 10 by writing, Concerning this salvation. Concerning this salvation, as a result of this salvation, and then in three verses helps us to see just how amazing this salvation is. Your circumstances might not change. Life might be a constant struggle, but Peter wants to encourage and remind us of just how incredible this salvation we have is, even as we trudge through the trenches of life. You see, following on from last week, Peter is still writing this very long sentence. He's He's not fond of full stops from verse 3 to verse 12. It's one big sentence. And remember, in verses 3 to 9, we, we, we already reflected on this wonderful salvation, haven't we? This living hope, this new birth through the resurrection of Jesus and into an, into an inheritance that cannot spoil or perish or fade. This is the salvation of our souls, Peter says in verse 9. And, and so following on and, and keeping on with that thought, Peter says in verse 10... I want to reflect on this salvation more. I want to keep talking about this salvation some more. So let's talk a little bit more about this salvation this morning. And he wants us, uh, by using that phrase concerning this salvation, to see three things to encourage us this morning. Concerning this salvation, first of all, the prophets predicted this. Concerning this salvation, Christ is at the center. And then concerning this salvation, we're more privileged than prophets and angels. And really, it's that, that third point that is the main thrust of these verses. So points one and two will be a lot shorter, leading us up into this glorious reality that we're more privileged than prophets and angels. So let's look at our first point then. The, the prophets predicted this. Concerning this salvation, the prophets predicted this. Imagine being told of this living hope that we come across in verse 3, of believing it, as, as many of us do. The hope of this inheritance that doesn't fade or spoil or perish. And yet living in a world of disappointments, pain and trouble. Well, you don't have to imagine it, do you? Because we live in such a world. And in living in it, we can often lose our perspective, can't we? We can perhaps think whether God knew what he was doing all along. Does he have a plan? And, and how do we know? Well, Peter says, yes, he does have a plan. God does have a plan because his salvation wasn't cooked up overnight. God has been planning this for a while now. 
And we know this because the prophets of old prophesied about this salvation. It's, it's got a long pedigree. Just look at, with me at the, the beginning of verse 10. Concerning the salvation, the prophets who spoke or literally prophesied of the grace that was to come to you. Why can you be encouraged this morning to keep going in trials? Why is this salvation worth it? Because this salvation didn't come out of the blue. This salvation wasn't some untimely accident, but part of God's plan from the very beginning. And Peter wants his readers and us to know that this salvation, it was predicted, it was prophesied about. It has pedigree in the prophets, as it were. A long history of, of waiting and anticipation. The salvation, it goes back to the promises of the Old Testament, as we were saying with the children. And Peter himself, as he writes in this letter, is very keen to show just that. The Old Testament prophets connect to the message of Christianity, whether in how we live or what was promised. So, just a little taster for the two chapters to come. Peter will... He will quote from Moses in Exodus and Leviticus and Deuteronomy. He will quote Isaiah. He will quote King David in Psalm 34. He will allude to Hosea, and that's just the first two chapters of Peter. He's saying these prophets knew there was amazing grace to come. These promises were dripping with the promise of grace, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you. These are the prophets. But the problem was they couldn't see the bigger picture. They couldn't see what we see now. Now, I was on holiday a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, and I did a jigsaw with three of my nephews. A uh, hundred pieces of a 3D jigsaw. Um, believe it or not, it's harder than it looks. Um, two of them were very helpful. So the six and the four-year-old, they knew what they were doing. In fact, they were better than me at it. Uh, they were doing this, uh, this farm scene because they're from the country. You know, they, they like tractors. Uh, so two of them were really, really good. The two-year-old, he hadn't quite grasped the concept of jigsaws. And what he did, he kept on doing, he kept on doing two things. He would remove the big picture away from us, uh, which we, I can tell you, if you're trying to do a jigsaw and you don't have the big picture in view, is really, really difficult. But also, he would, he would take little pieces of the jigsaw and hide them. <laughs> now, I don't want to get my excuses in, but when you don't have the big picture in front of you, and when you don't have the pieces of the jigsaw to complete the picture, well, it's, it's really hard. You can't do that. And it's as if the prophets here, they, they didn't have the big picture in front of them, did they? Uh, and they didn't have all the pieces of the jigsaw yet. And so they only saw bits and pieces of, of the picture with no firm idea of the circumstances or the context in which this grace, this salvation was to come. Just read with me verse 11. They, they said, didn't they, they were trying to find out the, the, the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing. When were the promises going to happen and how? That's the prophets were just, when are they going to happen? They, they had enough to know something amazing was going to happen. They had enough to know that somebody was going to come. And so they searched. Verse 10. They searched intently and with greatest care to try and find out more. Because, well, you would, wouldn't you? And probably their own writings, they were probably searching their own writings, and if they had other scripture uh, uh, available to them, they probably looked at that to try and fit the, this, these pieces of, of, the, of the picture together to see the, the bigger picture. That something huge was going to happen, and yet they, they just didn't have everything. But they knew that this was going to happen, that something amazing was going to happen. It's because Peter writes the Spirit of Christ in them, the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing them towards this salvation. In fact, we, if we're going to be more accurate with this point, it really should be, it was the Spirit of Christ that was doing the predicting, verse 11, in them. It was the Spirit of Christ in them, showing them of the Christ to come, which means this is a dead certainty. This is a dead certainty. This wasn't something made up. It was God at work himself predicting and pointing them to this grace that is to come to us. 
So be assured that God knows what he is doing. He has a plan. This salvation has pedigree in the prophets. And of course, at the center of this salvation, at the center of this grace, Peter says, is one figure. The spirit of Christ was pointing them to a person, to salvation, to grace in the form of one person alone. And we know who that person is, don't we? It is Jesus Christ. Because Christ is at the center. When when we're concerning this salvation, when we're looking at this salvation... Christ is at the center of it all. Now, when, we, when we read our Old Testament, we can, we can sense that kind of anticipation, can't we? Uh, there was an anticipation of this figure coming, as we've been saying, a king coming, a, a rescuer coming. Remember, uh, I don't know if you've read Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Aslan is mentioned quite a few times. The anticipation of Aslan. Uh, we get to know a little bit about Aslan before he actually appears on the scene. And it's a bit like that here, that the prophets were anticipating, knowing there was something was coming. And yet it was the Spirit of Christ, the second person in the Trinity, was pointing them to what? Verse 11, read with me. Pointing when he predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. The Spirit of Christ was pointing them to a future king who would suffer but also have glories. So even the prophets knew this Messiah, that this Christ, this anointed one, this rescuer king, was going to suffer, and then glories would follow. That's the pattern. Suffering first, then glory. It's the pattern of Christ. And the prophets wanted to know more about these sufferings and about these glories, because as I said, you would, wouldn't you? If you, if you had this amazing uh, um, uh, prophecy from the Spirit and you wrote down, you just would want to look more into it, wouldn't you? You just would. And you get glimpses of these amazing glories, these amazing sufferings in the Old Testament. And let me say... If you're not a Christian here this morning, this is a great invitation to do what the prophets did, to search carefully, to search really carefully about this Messiah who would come, this Christ who would come. And when you open up the Old Testament, you see glimpses of these sufferings, you see glimpses of these glories. Let me give you a couple of examples. We looked earlier on in the summer, didn't we? Psalm 22. Psalm 22, when David, who, yes, he's, he's, he's reflecting on his own experiences to a degree, but David is pointing us towards this, this forsaken king who would be mocked and whose hands and feet would be pierced, his sufferings. And yet at the end, cry, he has done it. He achieved the victory and all peoples, rich and poor, will worship and feast, bowing to the Lord, his glories. You can imagine David would have searched intently and with the greatest care for such a day and such a king, couldn't you? Oh, Peter in chapter 2 is going to quote from one of the chapters in the Bible that speaks about this most clearly in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53. Written 700 years before Christ comes, Isaiah writes in chapter 53, well, let me read a few verses, uh, speaking of his sufferings and speaking of his glories. If you want to turn with me to Isaiah 53, verses 5 to 6, we read this about the future, about the sufferings of the Messiah. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of his all, Christ's sufferings. And then verses 10 and 11, Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After he has suffered, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. Glories. By his his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. And again, you can imagine, can't you, Isaiah 
wanting to search intently and with the greatest care when the Spirit of Christ points him to the Christ who will suffer before the glories that will follow. And of course, we have more pieces in the jigsaw than Isaiah and David. And so we know that the Christ, the promised Savior, who would suffer and yet taste many glories is Jesus Christ. We know the untold, multi-layered sufferings of the cross, being beaten, being crucified, being mocked, being pierced, bleeding and slowly being asphyxiated as his weight crushes his lungs. And that's just the physical pain. What about the spiritual pain of being forsaken, of taking our sin in our place, bearing our iniquities? This is the sufferings that they were pointing to and yet we know. Praise the Lord for such a Christ, for such a King, this salvation, this grace concerning Jesus. This salvation centers on Christ and his sufferings, on the King that would be crucified, but also on the King and his glories. And as we have the bigger picture in view, we've got more pieces in the jigsaw, uh, we know that, that probably Peter is at least reflecting on two things when he thinks about glories, plural, more than one. He's thinking of Peter, uh, God's, uh, Christ's glorious resurrection and glorious return. His glorious resurrection and glorious return. Peter has already commented on both, verse 3 about his resurrection, verse 8 when Christ is revealed and returns. And it's this last glory, by, by the way, the glorious return that Peter will reflect on more and more as we look at this letter starting next week, as we'll see. Two glories, Christ's glorious resurrection and glorious return. Jesus has risen gloriously from the grave. He has defeated death. He has conquered death. And through his resurrection, we get our living hope, as we saw last week. Something certain and concrete we can hold on to. Something sure and true. And by his glorious resurrection, we know that he will gloriously return. And then we will enter into the glorious inheritance. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for his glories. This salvation centers on Jesus. His sufferings followed by his glories. Never forget that. That is the center of this salvation. And before we move on to our next point, the main point. Point three, let me see, say Peter will follow this pattern, sufferings, glories, for Jesus' followers too. Sufferings followed by glories. By the time we get to the beginning of chapter five, it will be crystal clear that the Christian life is sufferings first, then glory. He's setting up here in the pattern of the Christ. So concerning this salvation, Peter says the prophets predicted this. Christ is at the center. And then finally, building up to all that, we're more privileged than prophets and angels. Just let that sink in for a second. Concerning this salvation, we're more privileged than prophets and angels. This is Peter's conclusion in verse 12. Read with me verse 12. It was revealed to them, that is the prophets, that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke of the things that have now been told you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Even angels long to look into these things. This salvation, this, this grace, this Christ, this good news, this gospel preached is so amazing that the prophets wanted to know more and the angels longed to know more. And what is so special and so amazing about this reality is that we do. We do know more. We know more than the prophets and the angels because we have a better idea of the bigger picture and because this grace is for us. We've experienced what the prophets wanted to know and what the angels long to know. We're more privileged than prophets and angels 
because this salvation, this grace, this Christ has come for you and me. Did you, did you notice that in, in verse 10? Yeah, I'm sure you did. That the prophets who were prophesying, who spoke of the grace that was to come to you, to the readers of Peter and by extension us, anyone who trusts in Jesus Christ because of his sufferings and because of his glories. Yes, now let's, let's, let's not forget that the prophets experienced a measure of God's saving grace as they looked forward to the promises that were being uh, uh, put in the Old Testament and they are saved as a result of trusting in those promises. They are still saved because of Christ but we experience it more fully than we did, than they did, more clearly now, more universally, as the Spirit from heaven, the same Spirit who pointed the prophets to the Christ, helps us proclaim and see Christ now. The Spirit of Christ, who pointed the Old Testament prophets towards the, the Christ that was coming, the same Spirit, the Spirit from heaven, gives us that Christ now opens up the eyes of our hearts to Christ now, to Jesus our Saviour. We have more pieces in the jigsaw. We're more privileged than prophets. Why? Because we live in the age where Christ has come, the age of fulfilment, the age where the promises have been kept in Christ, the age of Christ and his kingdom. We're part of his kingdom, which means which means the least in the kingdom is greater than the greatest of prophets like John the Baptist, as Jesus says in Matthew eleven eleven, because we can know Jesus. We know the Christ the, the prophets were pointing to. We are more privileged than the prophets. And let's not forget that Peter says here in verse 12, the prophets weren't serving themselves in pointing to the Messiah. They were serving us. Serving all believers from Acts 2 and Pentecost onwards until Christ gloriously returns. The prophets who wanted to know more were told, verse 12, that they were serving ordinary Christians, faithfully standing firm in the various trials of life. They were serving ordinary Christians who felt underappreciated and unloved. They were serving ordinary Christians who feel the pressures of work, who feel the pressures of life, who feel the pressures of family, who, who've experienced pain and upset and hardship. They're serving ordinary Christians like us. And just think about the list of prophets that I mentioned earlier. Moses, David, Isaiah, Hosea, Great leaders, even great kings, great figures in history, great spiritual giants, and they were serving not themselves, but us. You, me. They wanted to know more. They desperately wanted to put the jigsaw pieces together because they knew whatever was going to happen was going to be big. Whoever was going to come was going to be huge. Whatever was going to take place would change the world, but they could never see clearly because until Christ came, nobody saw the bigger picture. They saw in shadows, but we see more clearly now Christ has come. And so they were, they were like builders, as it were, putting up the scaffolding down so that we can experience the luxuries of the building inside. They, they were pointing us to a saviour so we could experience and bask in and rejoice in his grace. They were, they were serving a higher purpose, laying down the seeds of the gospel so that we could taste its fruits. They, they wanted to know more. And what they wanted to know, we do and can know in Christ. You see, the prophets realized that their aim was to point us to this Jesus in the Old Testament, even though they couldn't see the king fully, so that we might rejoice and be amazed more at this grace, this Christ we see in salvation. So when we're reading David in the Psalms, when we're reading Isaiah, when we're reading Moses in, in the first five books of the Bible, when we're reading the Old Testament, we should realize the privileged position we're in. We are being served a feast as these prophets help us see more of the greater feast in Christ, salvation. 
We see more because they help us see more. They help us put the pieces together. They help us join the dots, help us see that all of the Old Testament is pointing to the King so that we can know Christ. We can know Christ crucified. We can know Christ our Savior. We can know why he came and who he came for, that he came to save sinners and to glorify his Father. This is the privileged position we're in. The prophets are serving us, helping us see this. Maybe read the Old Testament in that light next time you pick up the Old Testament and read one of the prophets. They are serving us. And this salvation is so amazing, so glorious, so utterly staggering that Peter doesn't stop there. He writes something even more amazing, really. Right at the end, even angels long to look into these things. Even those heavenly beings who live in the presence of our holy God long to look into these things. And the word long there uh, is often used of intense desires. This isn't a mere curiosity for angels. This is something they wish, they long, they desire to know more of. But what could angels who live in the presence of God, creatures of great power, privileged creatures themselves, possibly long to know more of? Well, it has to do with the salvation that we've been talking about, doesn't it? That Peter is writing about. You see, angels might be messengers, they might be servants, they might even be agents of judgment, mighty beings. But they will never know God the way we know God. Because they will always know God simply as Lord. When they come to Jesus, they only see Jesus as Lord. When we come to Jesus, we see him as brother. As the writer of the Hebrews tells us. We are co-heirs, as Paul tells us. When, when they come and they think of, of God, uh, they, they can only come and think of God as master. But as Peter tells us right at the beginning in verse 3, we come to God the Father, which makes all the difference in the world. We have new birth. We have forgiveness we have grace we have a relationship with jesus that is so much more intimate than the angels can ever have and they long to know more about what we have in christ as good as the angels have it and they've got it good they haven't got new birth They haven't got the good news. They haven't got this living hope. They haven't got this salvation. They haven't got or experienced the grace of Jesus because this is the grace that is coming and has come to us, not them. That is amazing. The grace that is to come has not come to the angels. It's come to us. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so they're looking in from the outside, as it were, these powerful beings who stand in the holy presence of God, desperately longing, desperately wanting to experience what we have. Not in a resentful way, I don't think, because the writer of the Hebrews says in in chapter 1 of Hebrews, verse 14, that they're ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. And so as they serve us, they they long to know more about what we have in Christ. Because this salvation is everything. This salvation is that amazing. This salvation is that mind-blowing, is that good, that the holy angels, the angels in the holy presence of God want to know more, long to know more. We're more privileged than angels. We are more privileged than angels. This is the view of salvation we need to have when circumstances help us lose perspective, when we might get mocked or disrespected, when we are struggling, when we're feeling weighed down, we have to remember that we are more privileged 
than angels. This salvation is worth it. Christ in his sufferings and glories is worth it. And when we realize just how amazing this salvation is, it's like we're giving a, a life jacket, as it were, to help keep our head just above the water as, as life struggles, uh, threaten to drown us. This salvation, if we, if we hold on to it, is like that life jacket, just keeping our heads above the water. Knowing that this salvation is worth it, it helps us to get through, or it's like armor, absorbing all the, the attacks that we feel life is just hitting us. It's like a tonic, a never-ending tonic to encourage us when we're down, something to hold on to when we're desperate. It's like we're given hope that this salvation is worth persevering in, because what the prophets wanted to know, and what the angels longed to know, we have in Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we're going to respond through worship, through praise, through singing. And we're going to respond with that classic hymn asking that question, and can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? And you can imagine the angels asking that question, and can it be that they should gain an interest? If you're able, please join me and stand as we sing about this amazing love.
Leslie fellow had a gift, didn't he, for putting into words uh, how we feel and how we should feel about this wonderful salvation. If you're watching this as a, a recording on Catch Up, that's uh, the end of the service. And thank you so much for watching and do uh, look us up again. Mm-hmm.